If you close your eyes, you can imagine the faint smell of chlorine, the feeling of tile under your feet as warm water laps at your waist. Your breath catches as you inhale the humid vapors that hang low in the room. Your voice echoes through the empty halls, becoming a multitude as it gets thrown back and forth between the eldritch shapes of columns and shafts leading to distant waters you can only guess at through the shadows that conceal them. It appears you found yourself in the dream pools. A few months ago, images started popping up all over YouTube in liminal space compilations of white-tiled, water-filled rooms lit by a warm light. They soon got more and more popular and even got their own community devoted to them. The artist and creator of these imaginary poolscapes is Jared Pike. His earlier works, which precede his 3D renders of pools, fall under the category of vaporwave and surreal art. He now focuses mainly on a series of dream pools, motivating countless other people to create their own artworks. Jared Pike, in the same vein as artists such as Lucas Radcliffe, or more similarly P. Carrido, is now pioneering the niche genre that is the Dream Pools. There are a few videos on the Dream Pools, but personally they left me a bit unsatisfied. I still couldn't make sense of why these pictures seemed so special to me. Why do I get this feeling of dread but also the perverse desire to explore these pools, this sense of longing to drift in the tranquil blue waters? What can they say about us, about our nature and the nature of the world around us? So follow me as I share a few of my thoughts on these dreamlike scenes. So the first thing you'll notice is, well, there are multiple things you'll notice right away with these scenes. In some rooms you can still get the impression of being in a pool, albeit in a weirdly empty one. There are rails, stairs and even walkways or places you can stay and rest. You still have ties to what you know a pool is supposed to look like. But in others this impression fades entirely. The whole ground is filled with water with no rest in sight. It doesn't seem like the water is there on purpose, more like it flooded these halls. It's like an afterthought or a hastily revised copy of an original. From the beginning, the mere scale is enough to overwhelm the observer. The second thing you'll probably notice is that no matter which of the countless rooms you may step into, all of them are unconditionally devoid of any human presence. The function of a pool is rendered meaningless because no one is taking a bath there. It's just too expansive to be of any real recreational use. A loss of purpose occurs, as is mentioned in my previous video on Dreamcore. And in fact, you will see pictures of the dream pools pop up in Dreamcore compilations, or even more recent in Poolcore, an aesthetic entirely focused on these kinds of watery scenes. But still, it doesn't seem too bad, right? There is after all no immediate danger, and if you don't count the lack of food or shelter or anything remotely suggesting habitability, these rooms are not an explicitly hostile environment, at least not to a temporary kind of observer, a visitor if you will, and nothing more do we seem to be. The place seems fallen out of time, so it's difficult to be concerned with things such as hunger, or thirst or sleep. The pools have a backrooms kind of vibe with all their implications of endlessly expanding rooms, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole. The backrooms themselves are a kind of purgatory, a liminal in-between state of reality. I won't go into liminal spaces again, if you're interested I talk a bit more about them in my video on internet aesthetics. Now let's have a look at some of the dream pool's characteristics. This one is probably in the most known dream pool picture, a spiral staircase leading up into darkness. Apart from the opening in the ceiling, we only see one other possible point of entry, or exit, also well in shadow. It almost beckons to stay in this room, to never leave this small oasis of white tiles and water for an uncertain escape. It's something one can observe in various other dream pools. Always the place we're standing in appears to be the most certain, the safest option to stay in. A vortex luring you down into unknown depths, 
or vanishing points conveniently leading us into the dark. And no matter where we end up in the dream pools, we are encountering the same limited palette of materials. Clean off-white tiles, in some rare cases a metal railing, and apart from that only the achingly bright blue-green water everywhere. This monotony throws you off since you can make a distinction of where exactly you are in this maze. This sensory deprivation could potentially lead to mental distress or breakdown. Comparable phenomena in our world would be things like snow blindness or white torture, where a person is isolated in a room and deprived of any sensory information. This of course immediately conjures up connections to depictions of purgatory in works like the Divine Comedy. And a theory circling the web regarding the dream pools is that they indeed represent a kind of endless purgatory dreamscape out of this reality. This nightmarish or dreamlike feel can also stem from the waiting depth of the water in many of these rooms. It's not deep enough to swim, just high enough so it slows your movement, inhibiting any escape from potential pursuers. It's hard to grasp the nature of the dream pools, and that's also caused by the ambiguous style the rooms are held in. There are no embellishments or structural hints as to which period these pools could stem from. In a way, they are timeless in their design. The closest I could find were snapshots from 80s interior magazines and Calgon commercials. That does it! Calgon, take me away! Lose your cares in the luxury of a Calgon bath. Calgon softens the water to leave skin feeling silky smooth as it lifts your spirits. The soft, luxurious, fragrant world of Calgon. I love it. Pamper yourself with a Calgon bath. Lose yourself in luxury. The colors are also limited, the surreal water the only speck of color in the otherwise white rooms. I'm only talking about the daytime dream pools here by the way. Jared Pike does have a bunch of these rooms in a dawnlit or even artificially illuminated atmosphere. Noteworthy are even the ripples in the water, in a way they are comforting. If you were alone it would be still an undisturbed mirror, a thought even more terrifying than these friendly seeming ripples lapping at the stairwells. That poses another question. Where do they come from? After all, if there truly is no one else there, the water should lie motionless. The only explanation I could come up with is that maybe at some places there are drops to deeper levels creating a kind of waterfall, or, and this strikes me as an unnerving thought, the dream pools are so massive the rooms have developed their own tidal forces. The composition and makeup of the rooms are strangely geometric. Not only the usage of quote-unquote normal rooms with their cuboid shapes, but everything seems to be designed with a certain geometric aesthetic in mind. The room's strict geometric makeup and design are reminiscent of some kind of divine planning, even if tools like the golden ratio are not overtly apparent in any of the artworks. This divine element almost gives us the impression as if the construct itself was sentient. A word that comes to mind is sublime. It's based on the Latin word sublimus, a compound of sub, meaning under or up to, and limen, threshold. And we've heard of that one before, in the context of liminal spaces. More specific even, in art the sublime can refer to a theory developed by Edmund Burke in the mid-18th century, where he defined sublime art as something that refers to a greatness beyond all possibility of calculation, measurement or imitation. Burke proposed this idea in his work A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas and the Sublime and Beautiful, published in 1757. The sublime is described as an artistic effect productive of the strongest emotion the mind is capable of feeling. He wrote, whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects or operates in a manner analogous to terror is a source of the sublime. The notion that art can be used to produce upsetting or disturbing effects was groundbreaking and an important element back in romantic art. And it remains fundamental to art today as we can see with the dream pools or other works of art that fall into the category of liminal space. There is an almost supernatural lighting that seems to illuminate every room we happen to find ourselves in. It seems there is nowhere that light can't reach, though there are countless dark pits and obstructed hallways that remain in the dark as if consciously omitted from our gaze. The ubiquitous light is illogical, it makes everything seem like a facade, a carefully curated experience that hides its deeper implications. And if everything is fake, it doesn't matter if you see the whole picture, you'll never come closer to the truth. The segmentation into rooms and the light falling in seemingly everywhere implies an outside, but we never get to see it. Here and there we can see something resembling windows, but we can never quite make out what's behind them. 
It could just be another room, the thing we held for windows, just another corrupted shape, wretched from its original use. For all intents and purposes, these rooms stretch into infinity. I'm determined to explore as much of the world as I can in my lifetime. I've climbed up to the upper halls where clouds move in slow procession and statues appear suddenly out of the mist. I've explored the drowned halls where the dark waters are carpeted with white water lilies. I've seen the derelict halls of the east where ceilings, floors, sometimes even walls have collapsed and the dimness is split by shafts of grey light. In all these places I've stood in doorways and looked ahead. I've never seen any indication that the world was coming to an end, but only the regular progression of halls and passageways into the far distance. This is a quote from Susanna Clarke's novel Piranesi, where the eponymous character travels through an endless structure he calls the house. It's a building so massive he proposes the house is everything there is, interchangeably using descriptions like the world for it too. The main character's name is a reference to 18th century Italian architect and artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi. He was known for a series of etchings depicting inconceivable architecture, causerie d'invenzione, imaginary prisons. Here too the structures dominate everything, spiraling into dizzying heights, disappearing into clouds and columns, gigantic cavernous halls that seem to be stretching miles. Battista Piranesi confronts us with buildings so unfathomably massive it's unthinkable they could have ever been built by humans. This premise of mind-bending huge architecture is something that repeatedly pops up not only in fiction too. Though it yet is the firm domain of theory and science fiction, scientists have proposed superstructures like gyrating spaceships or even Dyson spheres encasing entire stars. But while these may seem massive, nothing compares to the imaginary infinities described in fiction like Jorge Luis Borges' Library of Babel. The universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite, perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries. I am prepared to die a few leagues from the hexagon where I was born. When I am dead, compassionate hands will throw me over the railing. My tomb will be the unfathomable air. My body will sink for ages and will decay and dissolve in the wind engendered by my fall, which shall be infinite. I declare that the library is endless. The narrator describes the holy task of wandering the endless hexagons of the library, searching for the ultimate truth, for there must exist a book in which the future is predicted perfectly, and a book where the answers to all questions lie. On some shelf in some hexagon it was argued there must exist a book that is the cipher and perfect compendium of all other books and some librarian must have examined that book. This librarian is analogous to a god. For the librarians living in the library, that is the universe, or vice versa, the search for truth and the wandering is nothing short of a holy task. One must wonder then what purpose there can be in this whole act of passing through space when there is nothing of significance there. But, as not to stray too far from the subject matter, we'll have to consider the early origins of bathing culture and its purpose. The ancient Greeks were the first to really pioneer the modern bath. The gymnasiums of Greece were places to train and to host public events. The ancient Greek term gymnos actually means naked, meaning athletes competed there in the nude as a way to appreciate the male form. Fast forward, gymnasiums had to provide athletes with a place to bathe after their exercises, so there's where showers appeared first. Later in Rome, the ritual of bathing was taken to another level, the public bathing houses often becoming the center of communal activity and everyday life. But that's just it. Apart from cleansing the spirit at Holy Springs, the bathing culture was focused on connecting people. Taking a bath was a means of social interaction and partaking in it was not only of recreational use, but meant staying in the loop with public affairs. Yet. Looking at the dream pools, it's easy to see how there seems to be a fundamental flaw with them. They're not actually practical. As mentioned before, the sheer space is so overwhelming it's ridiculous to assign these rooms any recreational use, let alone the prospect of communal bonding. In earlier times, there was one man for every three hexagons, an unspeakably melancholy memory. I've sometimes traveled for nights on end down corridors and polished staircases without coming across a single librarian. The size diminishes the possibility to even find another person, the structure renders any real proximity meaningless, it becomes apparent that these pools aren't really meant to be used by anyone, they're self-serving, an inherent contradiction to ancient and modern building standards alike. 
Sadi Marechal writes in his paper on the research on Roman bathing, It is remarkable how the majority of early works about Roman bathing habits tend to focus on architectural features, including the adornment of the buildings. He calls this the architectural habit, and it's true, one cannot help but notice the significance of architectural elements when comparing works such as the dream pools to the ancient Greco-Roman styles. Ultimately, looking for adornments in the dream pools will prove to be useless. There are none, the unembellished rooms a cipher refusing analysis. The structure seems almost Kafkaesque at times, nonsensical and recurring like a fractal fever dream of an architect like Battista Piranesi. I am saying structure, expanse and so on. Maze, house, building, universe, call it what you want. Fact is, all of these seem inadequate. They're just proxies for something that ultimately falls short of what we feel to be the truth that the dream pools are, in a weird way, a live, a sentient entity, and that our pinhole view of these rooms through the artworks is only a fragment of what's actually there. And when we are confronted with a thing that so obviously transgresses the boundaries of its nature, we cannot help but assign it deeper significance, give it almost anthropomorphic qualities, like Piranesi in Clark's novel, we treat it as a living thing as opposed to an inanimate object. With every structure, every building, it begs the question not only of its purpose, but also of its builder. But because the question as to the purpose and builder is ridiculous with the dream pools, in a way they transcend the very notion of a built thing. In the back of your mind you know these rooms are artificial, created. It's startling that something unnatural could ever be so massive, so all-encompassing. It defies the expression man-made, yeah, even to insinuate these rooms could have ever been built by man is laughable. The sheer existence mocks our preconceived notion of natural and artificial, for if it wasn't built then it must have always been there, it must be natural. But it is not, it's a creation. It is by nature a paradox, irreconcilable with reality. The library existed ab eternitat. That truth, whose immediate corollary is the future eternity of the world, no rational mind can doubt. The universe, with its elegant appointments, its bookshelves, its enigmatic books, its indefatigable staircases for the traveler, and its water closets for the seated librarian, can only be the handiwork of a god. I think it's important to discuss the term dream pools all of these pictures carry. The name was given to them by Jared Pike himself, who stated that he just wanted to create surreal liminal spaces. And surreal they are. They do seem unreal, almost idealistic in how clean and devoid of people they are. They carry this uncanny, dreamlike atmosphere. Looking at them, these pools must be a pure mirage, an act of our imagination. All the little inconsistencies in what we expect versus what we perceive add up to create this feeling that something isn't quite right. That's the liminal space part of it. This uneasy feeling is also connected to the fear of being lost or trapped in these dream pools, however you want to look at it. Trying to leave is a Sisyphus task, it's pointless. How can we hope to measure up against what seems to be, on all accounts, a true infinity? We intuitively know that we are powerless in front of these halls. Worth mentioning is also that Jared Pike's artworks are numbered, not named, like spiral staircase or small pools for example. It's impersonal and lends itself to the structure's recurring nature. While you would eventually run out of distinctive names or visual cues, with this system you could go on forever. It's an objective way to think about these rooms, an almost scientific approach. If one were to find themselves in these endless rooms, they probably would try to make this distinction by name. However, this endeavor would prove to be futile in the end. In Susanna Clarke's novel, Piranesi sees himself as a scientist and explorer and he catalogues the halls he passes through diligently. But when keeping track of time, he abandons the conventional numbering system and gives the years distinctive characteristics to remember them by. I have named two years 2011 and 2012. This strikes me as deeply pedestrian. Also, I cannot remember what happened 2000 years ago, which made me think that year a good starting point. I have given the years names like the year I named the constellations and the year I counted and named the dead. I like this much more. It gives each year a character of its own. What I gathered from my research for these artworks is that your attitude towards your surroundings is very much dependent on what's going on inside you. There is nothing out there, neither good nor bad, no signs and signs of life. You impose your inner world, your fears and insecurities onto these rooms. 
But from various comments and discussions on these artworks, it becomes apparent the effects can also be the exact opposite. That people see in this room something they lack or long for and it becomes a source of comfort. For them, these pools offer a kind of escapism into a dreamscape where they can be alone for a while. More on that in a moment. You see, it can go both ways. It can be both a comforting and unsettling experience. To borrow a quote from an earlier video, art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And it still applies here. In a way, when being confronted with these scenes, it's like looking into a mirror and seeing aspects of yourself, a blank canvas to project your soul onto. I suppose it can be a cleansing, almost spiritual experience, this state of revelation, this act of being in this space, experiencing infinity on and under your skin. It draws up comparisons to divine revelations driving people insane or present more moderately in meditation. A device that also comes to mind thinking about the experience inside the dream pools is a sensory deprivation chamber or isolation tank. It's a lightless, soundproof tank with denser than body water at roughly body temperature. They're also used for meditation and therapy for anxiety and stress disorders. And that's a recurring theme when scrolling through the discussions surrounding Jared Pike's artworks, the absolute feeling of serenity and stress relief. In an isolation tank, the body is deprived of any sensory information, which causes the feeling of the body boundary to fade. You don't know where your body ends and your surrounding begins. Some describe it as becoming less of yourself and yet more of everything, a notion that rings true for descriptions of meditative states and this almost spiritual experience some imagine having in the dream pose. But distancing oneself from modern devices, even in ancient civilizations, the importance of a ritual judging the self or this reflection on your being was known, apparent for example in the weighing of the heart in ancient Egypt. And there too it's like a liminal in-between state, a stage you have to pass through to proceed to the afterlife. You could also look at these renders as a modern and more implicit version of Baroque still life paintings with a memento mori motif. We are subtly confronted with our mortality. Not through the imagery of empty flasks and rotting fruit, but a promise of despair for anyone who tries to rebel against the confines of the dream pool's reality. In a way, at least in my opinion, it's this promise of solitude too that ultimately constitutes the spiritual component I get from the artworks. The minimalism put forth in the dream pools seem to mock our worldly obsessions as they become irrelevant within the expanse of empty halls. It almost beckons the quest for spiritual enlightenment, a cleansing purpose that goes deeper than ridding the body of impurities, but also the soul. What many people are drawn to in these pictures is exactly that feeling of detachment. The opportunity to escape the current state of forced social withdrawal and exchange it with a voluntary one. Loneliness, by definition the unmet need for belonging, is different from being alone based on how much control a person has over social interactions. Loneliness in itself is a passive state not sought out from the individual. Solitude is a choice without the negative strings attached. A modern term coined after the now widely known withdrawal from social media apps is social detox. It can help to recalibrate oneself and focus on mental health. In this way, the dream pools are acting as an instrument to draw out our desire for mental equilibrium. Does intention matter? The question begs itself because Jared Pike himself doesn't give us a definite answer as to what these dream pools represent or what they can mean. He didn't have any intended meaning in mind for them at all. As for me, I like to think they're an attempt to reconcile with the infinite, a concept hard to grasp for our finite existences, whose whole lives are being defined by beginnings and endings. So when we come across a truly liminal experience, an infinity captured in one frame, for a brief moment we are lost. Our framework of thinking is shattered and we feel adrift, untethered. The seemingly infinite space confronts us with the finite nature of ourselves, because even though this space may be infinite, our time isn't. One can imagine becoming like Piranesi in the novel or like the inhabitants of Borges library, deeply obsessed with a pure concept of space, endlessly wandering in the water-filled rooms. To overinterpret it even further, in our current consumerist and over-commercialized reality, the goal is all that counts. Results, profits, diplomas, the very state of transition and the prospect of the never-ending is a concept that doesn't mix well with our reward-oriented selves. Our journey, our struggles should be rewarded. We don't usually think of the struggle or the work we put into something as the actual reward. 
but that's exactly what the dream pulls seem to demand of the viewer. As it pulls us in, it demands we submit fully to its confines, not of space, but time, to come to terms with the reality that we could wade through these eerie halls for years and neither find another living soul nor an end to the infinitely recurring poolscapes. It's easy to see now how one can lose themselves in these images, imagine actually being there in these vast arrays of halls and tiles and water and light, and I hope to have made it a bit clearer what so many people make the dream pools out to be, a sanctuary for the lost. Mm -hmm.